when I was in primary school, there was a show on TV called Captain Planet. Now, if you are a child of the 90s or raised a child in the 90s, it might ring a bell. Captain Planet was a superhero who, with his team of planeteers, responded to various environmental emergencies. So if there was a massive oil spill or illegal deforestation taking place somewhere, Captain Planet and his team would take it on using their special rings that gave them over the elements. It was action-packed with strong environmental messaging and a good dose of pantheism on the side. At the end of each episode, a segment taught children how they could be planeteers too by learning which recycling bin to use and not leaving the lights on. And as someone who generally put my chip packet in the bin at school, saving the planet seemed fairly achievable. But there's actually another message being communicated by this TV show, though unintended. And the message is this, that our Earth is in great danger due to the neglectful and destructive activities of humans, and it would take someone with superpowers to save it. I remember one episode in particular where Captain Planet lifts up the nuclear reactor in danger of melting down. He carries it beyond Earth's atmosphere and then he hurls it into the center of the sun. If only, right? <laughs> uh, fast forward 30 years and the environmental concerns of the planeteers are more mainstream than ever. Whether it be children's television, the media, the climate scientists, or David Attenborough, we continue to hear this story about a planet in danger. There are plenty warning us that we are only a few years away from having done irreversible damage to the climate. Some think we passed that point years ago that we're beyond saving. Now, there are, of course, more optimistic voices out there. Those who think we can still turn things around. If we can just eliminate food waste and work out how to grow more food on less land, uh, if we can switch to 100% renewable energy by yesterday and cease production of all plastics, if we can just develop biotech products to leach carbon from waste and regenerate the soil, reforest the Amazon, persuade all politicians and corporations to stop acting selfishly, then everything will probably be fine. Now, it could just be my cynicism, but next to lists like these, a flying pollution-busting superhero doesn't seem so far-fetched. Our secular culture the TV shows and the media that we consume are telling us a story about our planet. And it's a grim story to my ears. It's a story that produces in us anxiety. How much longer can we inhabit this planet? Uh, and anger. I have remembered all my reusable shopping bags this week, but those people over there are not lifting a finger to help the environment. It's a story that induces guilt and lays a heavy burden on those of us with a tender conscience. And lastly, it's a story that brings grief as we mourn the bleaching of the reef, turtles choking on plastic bags, rising tides eating away the homes of the poorest inhabitants of the Pacific Islands. But tonight you've come to hear a different story. You've come to hear what Jesus thinks of all this. What's the Bible's take on it? I think the Bible story does intersect with the story out there at certain points, but I'm hoping you'll see it offers something more compelling, more challenging, and ultimately more hopeful. But tonight we're laying the groundwork. To begin with, the Bible story differs to the story out there when it comes to the how and why of planet Earth. Because for Christians, it's not just an accidental explosion and various atoms tripping over each other that led to life as we know it. We believe this planet has a design and that every atom is infused with purpose because it was set in place by a purposeful and personal God. The book of Genesis in the Bible gives us two stories, actually, about the creation of the world. Or rather, the same story, but from different angles. And it's worth having a closer look right now because this is the foundation 
for what Jesus teaches. So if you want to flick back in your Bible to page one, where Genesis one is, in chapter one of Genesis, God simply speaks creation into being. He speaks into the chaos and light, land, sea, sky, vegetation and living creatures appear in perfect order. Then right at the end of this creation story, the narrative seems to slow down as God says, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So humans are placed in creation with a special role, an authority over it. That's the shimmery rays coming out from them. That's their authority. That's their rule. And in some way, that's meant to look a bit like God's authority. But it's still very much dependent on and subject to his rule. We are rulers. We are masters. And that's the way God designed it. The way some environmentalists speak, it's as though humans are an unfortunate plague breaking out and spreading across the earth. But no, first and foremost, we are the image of God, the true ruler of this creation. Like God, we bring order to chaos too. We come to a wild and challenging environment and instead of needing to adapt to survive in it, like the animals, we adapt to the environment to support our survival and the needs of our communities. We put up shelters that protect us from the elements and house families for generations. We develop technology and machinery to build roads, tunnels, bridges, etc., to connect us to other communities. We turn the wood of the bamboo plant into this buttery soft fabric that we wrap babies in. We grow mandarins with no seeds in them. We pluck copper out of the earth and somehow work that into a device that allows us to reach into our pockets and reach out to family on the other side of the globe. Our capacity to rule, to bring order to the chaos in our surroundings is unmistakably godlike. But this kind of mastery is not the only sort of ruling God does. In chapter two of Genesis, we get another account of God creating life. And if chapter one gave us the big aerial view, Chapter 2 gives us the intimate on-the-ground angle. We are right there in the garden with God and he's scooping up dust off the ground and he's shaping it into a man and he's breathing life into his nostrils and he sticks the man in the garden and tells him to work it and take care of it. He's meant to be the master gardener. Now, his first job is to name all the other living creatures. Now, this isn't a go get your label maker and we'll sort this lot out kind of activity. This was the man needing to get to know who he was going to take care of. Giving a name is an act of mastery, yes, but there's also a noticing and appreciating going on. Giving a name to something is the beginning of understanding what it is and how to care for it. When we first moved here, a couple of years ago, lockdown followed shortly after. So we spent a lot of time biking around the lake. And my son kept asking me the names of the water birds that we'd see along the way. And I realized I didn't really know my birds. So I started taking pictures on my phone and looking them up online. And do you know, they are fascinating. Once I knew their names, I couldn't help finding out more. Do you know, there's a little bird down there called a bar-tailed godwit. And it flies here each year from Alaska. It's such, it's such an unassuming little creature. There's nothing about it that says, I just flew here from Alaska this morning. That's amazing. And there are the little pied comorons. Now, unlike the ducks that are very buoyant and have water repellent feathers, comorons have these dense little bodies, super dense, and wings that become easily waterlogged. But that actually allows them to dive deep to catch their lunch. They even, they reckon they even swallow rocks sometimes for extra weight and then throw them up later. <laughs> but then, after diving, they have to perch on the rocks and hang their soaked wings out to dry before they can take off. 
What kind of a God thinks up stuff like that? The Bible says God's eternal power and his divine nature are clearly seen in the things that he has made. He has orchestrated everything in the ecosystem, not to mention the laws of physics, so that the little pied cormorant can get her lunch each day. Psalm 104 pictures God hand-feeding each living creature. That's the kind of intimate knowledge and devoted affection he has for them. God doesn't just rule by mastering the chaos and setting things in place. He rules by sustaining life in moment-by-moment care for the things he has made. He rules by serving his creatures. This is a supremely solemn responsibility we've been given to reflect God's way of ruling in the way we rule the world. We are not just masters in this place. We are servants too. We are charged uh, with caring for this creation and these creatures who are made of the very same stuff as we are, formed out of the ground, Genesis tells us, both us and the animals. So the Bible sets up this picture of our relationship to the environment in its very opening pages. We are both masters and servants of the creation. But a lot has changed since those early days of God's creation. In the world I live in today, humans have crossed the line from mastery of the creation to abuse and exploitation. We have crossed the line from service of the creation to cruel neglect and carelessness. We are the kind of rulers who feed the ducks down at the lake with bread right next to the sign that says, do not feed the ducks bread. What happened? Well, the next chapter of the Bible holds the answer. My kids are captivated by the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, This is the Euro edition of the first man and woman. I suspect they didn't quite look like that. But regardless of which visual aid you have, even little kids hear this story and recognise themselves in it. They see the tragedy coming a mile away because they already know how we humans work. We know that Eve should look around her and be thankful for all that she's been given. Every tree, every living thing, and a man to discover it all alongside her. But of course she wants the one thing she's been been denied access to, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's really the tree of calling the shots, of deciding for yourself how you will rule, how you will master, without reference to God, the capital M master. And when Eve takes that fruit and eats it and gives some to Adam, who has been standing by uselessly the whole time, something fundamentally breaks down in the created order. The man and woman want to rule their own way rather than ruling in the image of God, mastering, serving way. Their relationship with God is severed. They are forced to leave the garden where they were living alongside their creator and they are quite literally under a curse. And this curse then creates a series of fault lines running all over the place. Because their relationship with the true master is broken, a fault line also develops between the man and the woman. You see that immediately as Adam tries to pin the blame for everything on his wife. There's now hostility between the two people. And another fault line develops beneath our feet. There's now hostility between the people and the earth. God says, because of what you've done, the ground is now cursed. Why is the ground cursed? What did it do wrong? Remember in this story, we come from the ground. And so do all the living creatures. The breath of God made us distinct from the dust and the animals, but we are still interconnected. That's why God can say, for dust you are and to dust you will return. It's easy for us to look at our environmental problems and only see natural consequences. Isn't it just that we've ignored the instruction manual and, oh dear, now this earth machine is malfunctioning on us. But unfortunately, it's worse than that. A deep rift has formed between us and our creator and the rest of creation. 
why is our environment suffering? Why don't humans have a perfect relationship with creation? Well, it's because we don't have a perfect relationship with our creator. And because we don't have a perfect relationship with other humans. Here's how another part of the Bible puts it. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. See, what's, see what it's saying here. God is the one who put the creation under a curse. It was his decision that we would start to feel the effects of that fault line between us and God in an environment that is hostile and impossible to master at times. The writer continues, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now, that is a vivid picture, right? The floods, the storms, that textiles dump in Ghana that is perpetually on fire. Did you read about that? Uh, Pregnant women living in Jacobabad, now the hottest city on earth, are out working the melon fields in 51 degree heat. This creation is groaning. And the Bible says it's not just the natural consequences of our neglect, it's God's judgment on us in action. It's the terrifying repercussions of trying to rule creation when cut off from the wisdom of the Creator. Now, just consider this other fault line here. Because the broken relationships between people also somehow spill over into environmental degradation. When we're at war with each other, the land pays dearly. Think of the impact of trench warfare on forests and soils during the world wars, or the impact of nuclear warfare on the land. When we exploit each other, environmental problems are never far behind. Because multinational corporations trample on and exploit their workers, well, the protected forests of DR Congo can be strip mined so much faster, can't they? And on a much more subtle level for us, what about in individualistic cultures? Like ours in the first world, our disconnectedness is seen in how we seem to need more dwellings for less people and bigger houses to accommodate families who don't want to have to share space with each other. Even when we're not at war with each other, the somewhat polite way we keep our distance from each other in wealthy societies, it actually has an impact on our use of the land. The earth bears the scars of the violence and abuse between the people who are made to rule it and serve it. I want you to consider this quote from environmental lawyer Gus Speth. I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address those problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Selfishness, greed, and apathy. Problems that live inside the human heart. What can we do about this? Uh, As an educator, as a teacher, I've watched as over the years, learning about environmental sustainability went from one part of one learning area in the syllabus to being a cross-curriculum priority. That means now in every learning area, science, maths, English, music, students are made to consider the ramifications of human activity on the environment. But I think a greener curriculum and all the Captain Planet episodes in the world will not be able to educate out the selfishness, greed and apathy. If it could, then we should have a generation of teenagers coming through right now who, as well as staging walkouts about climate change, are also saying, Mum, Dad, don't buy me a new iPhone. I'm happy with this reconditioned Nokia because I know our obsession with upgrading devices is a heavy cost for the environment to bear. Now, I'm not picking on teenagers or smartphones. I just want to illustrate that 
consumerism cannot be easily educated out of us. Now, if not in education, can I place my hope and confidence in conservation groups, in activism, in grassroots movements like the Zero Wasters? Um, a year ago, I read an article about the Tassie Devils. There they are. Uh, you know they're in danger of being wiped out by this um, facial tumour disease, the ones that don't get hit by cars, that is. Uh, back in 2012, a small group of healthy devils uh, were taken to Mariah Island off the east coast of Tassie as an insurance population. Um, the island has a very similar climate, similar ecosystem to the main island, uh, and there are no cars on Mariah Island. Um, so it seemed like the perfect place to keep them safe. And it was great for the devils. They thrived, tripled in number. But the water birds that had enjoyed a predator-free haven on Mariah were terrorised. The little penguin population went from 3,000 pairs prior to 2012 to zero less than 10 years later. Now, I find this story so unsettling. I think partly because we see that even the people with the best intentions to care for living creatures can find their efforts frustrated. Education and conservation efforts and activism demonstrably fail at times. Now, they are great things, and don't for a minute hear me dismissing them, but they are not the saviours they are made out to be. Thankfully, God has provided a saviour. Sometimes when one of my sewing creations becomes too hard or needs a lot of unpicking, I bundle up all the scraps of fabric and I put them in a bag and I put them in the back of the cupboard where projects go to die. Uh, but thankfully, that's not what God does with his creation when things seem to be going haywire. There has never been a moment where he's forgotten about us or put us in the too hard basket. We've heard how he put the earth under a curse, but even as the judgment is still on his lips, he's talking about the day when he's going to right the wrongs and the curse will be lifted. A saviour would come. Not a Captain Planet, who is only ever really just spot cleaning things, but the true master and the true servant of creation, who offers the deep clean that renews the planet from the inside out. Did you know the Bible calls, Adam, uh, calls Jesus the new Adam, the one who will get it right? Not because he's a conservation expert, but because he has a perfect, unsevered relationship with God the Father and a perfect, loving relationship with his fellow humans too. Because there is no selfishness, greed or apathy in his heart. So next time I speak to you, we'll really be focusing in on Jesus, on God's plan to save the earth and the way his people are called to steward the land he gave them prior to Jesus' return. Um, but I've chosen to finish here, or soon, because I can't speak for much longer without you nodding off, um, and because I think we've actually got some work to do. Um, firstly, I think we need to bask in the Bible's teaching about a creator God. It is so beautiful and so important but sometimes I think we treat it as one of the basics covered in Sunday school. Um, Colin Buchanan sings, uh, There's a God who cares for the old black crow, the wombat, the gecko, and the kangaroo. Uh, but that's a song for kids. How come they don't write songs for grown-ups to sing in church about God caring for the wombat? Uh, because for adult believers, it's, it's, it's just assumed prior knowledge. Uh, but we need to sing Psalm 104. How countless are your works, Lord. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, vast and wide, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things, both large and small. Use the Psalms to reorient your heart towards the God who reveals his nature in the things that he has made. Secondly, as a little conscious exercise in being a master and servant in creation, Choose a plant or an animal that you have never cared for or maybe even noticed before. Get to know it. Figure out how you might care for it and then give it a go. Note down in a journal any of the joys or frustrations that come your way as you go about it. 
meditate on the fact that you and this plant or animal are made of the same stuff and made by the same heavenly father. I'm going to walk someone's dog. (laughs) I've never had a dog, uh, but I'm going to find a friend who has one and I'm going to ask if I can spend some time with it and take it for a walk, if that's what it wants to do. Um, I'm going to leave you with the words of an old hymn that I think really beautifully and simply um, capture some of these themes that we've discussed tonight. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. Praise God for that. I'm going to pray and then we'll have some dessert. Heavenly Father, you are our creator God and you want us to rule this place as masters and servants. And Father, we acknowledge that we have not done that. And we thank you that you have provided a saviour. And we pray that you would reorient our hearts um, towards you as our creator. And we pray that you would warm our hearts with an affection for the natural world that you've given us. In Jesus' name. Amen.